I'm Ann Temkin, the Marie Jose and Henry Kravitz Chief Curator of Painting and Sculpture. And as you know, we're here tonight to launch the book Inventing the Modern Untold Stories of the Women Who Shaped the Museum of Modern Art. And I'm just going to make a few introductory remarks for about five minutes. Then it will be a roundtable conversation between me and my co editor, Romy Smith. Do I know your names anymore? <laughs> um, and Sloan Crosley, and one, of, one of our contributors. And one of the interesting things that um, first sort of comes to mind as, as I'm standing here tonight is the fact that when we do a show, an exhibition, we work for many, many years, but the intensity is felt in the last 10 to 15 days when you're installing the works of art around the clock and you start it out that two or three, maybe at the most weeks early with an empty gallery. And at the end of that period, you have a full gallery and you have an opening night, mm -hmm. right? And so your show and the catalog that goes with the show is absolutely open as opposed to non-existent, you know, a day before. And with the book, as Sloan knows, um, it's much more amorphous. It's sort of like you're working for years and one day a box of books comes <laughs> <laughs> via the post office or FedEx or UPS. And like, oh, the book's here. But it's like, is anyone else opening a book? You don't know. Um, they're just sitting there in your office. So they sat in our office for about a month. Um, they actually went into bookstores about a week or two ago at the most. And um, you have no idea if um, anyone's read it yet. And meanwhile, of course, when you've done a show, you stand there at the curator watching gleefully like an eavesdropper in the cognito as people are looking at your pictures on the wall. So it's a very long-winded way of saying to all of you, thank you very much for being here and joining us to actually mark the birth of uh, the book as a physical object. Inventing the object. <laughs> Inventing the Modern is a project that's seven years in the making, and it began with the idea um, that I had probably more like 15 years ago in my mind when I was newly appointed um, head of PNS and was writing a little book on the Monet water lilies um, that went together with a special presentation that we did at them. And as you may know, those water lily paintings that are in our collections and have a gallery of their own and are so beloved um, were given by Mrs. Simon Guggenheim. And at that time, I was like, who is Mrs. Simon Guggenheim? And then, you know, it took me five minutes to remember, oh, this is Simon Guggenheim is also the person who gave the three musicians by Picasso, and the Shigo by Picasso, and six other Picassos. <laughs> and Mrs. Guggenheim is the person who gave the Red Studio by Matisse, and seven other Matisses. And Mrs. Guggenheim is the one who gave us any number of other paintings that are on view at all times on the fifth floor. And I'm like, how is she not somebody I know who she is? And I have my private theory in that by being Mrs. Guggenheim, she was kind of in the wrong museum. She was supposed to be in the museum 30 blocks up from here. And so that everybody was always just like a little confused and, you know, didn't want to get into why the Guggenheim was in the modern. And so um, I just investigated a bit at that time and realized among the miraculous things she did, um, she donated the water lilies 
not once, but twice, because the first time she donated two big water lily panels to MoMA, as you may or may not know, those were on the wall and were the only paintings that in our collection were destroyed by the 1958 fire. Huge outpourings of grief at that time. Mm. Alfred Barr went back to her and said, would you buy a phone and set? <laughs> at 10 times the price of what they had been just three years earlier, in part because of our own display of them uh, increasing their popularity. And she said, yes, of course. So this was planted in my head, and then we started to realize there were a lot more Mrs. Guggenheims, both among the trustees, among the staff members, and um, it was worth a whole book. And that's when Romy Silvercone came onto the project, and Romy um, had worked together with me and Peter Reed on the book about our sculpture garden several years ago called Oasis in the City, the Abbey Rockefeller Sculpture Garden at the Museum of Modern Art. And so she and I were close collaborators already. Um, and the project, um, even though it has individual authors for each of the essays, in a sense, um, Romy is the co-author of every essay because it's Romy who spent hours and hours um, in the archives building the case for each artist, and as well, I mean, each artist, see? Uh, mm -hmm. For each um, subject. So as you'll see um, later, uh, there are lots of stories to be told about what she found in the archives and, and what the um, most, uh, what should we say, perplexing um, detective stories, um, detective work, needed to be done um, in a, for putting a whole essay together about a certain person. In some cases, we didn't even know their birth date. Um, but, you know, that was dealt with. And um, we ended up really sketching profiles of 14 people who, even someone as famous, the most famous of all of ours, um, Abby Rockefeller, you know, there had been remarkably little known about until now, um, considering the enormity of her contribution. So our basic modus operandi was finding matches between authors and subjects. And we bring you an example of that tonight in having Sloan Crosley join Romy and me. One of the subjects in our book was the first publicity officer of the Museum of Modern Art. And um, her name was Sarah Neumeyer. She's one of the persons who literally we didn't even know the birth date. Until Sarah Neumeyer came along to have a museum do publicity was like a very unheard of thing. It was not dignified. It was not um, classy. <laughs> she did not um, worry about those things. <laughs> and Sloan is, as you all probably know, a very well-known memoirist now. Um, Free Fits for People is your new book, which we'll give you another chance to um, talk about a little side uh, attraction tonight. But, um, and, and novelist and has written hilariously, as, as well as really piercingly, about what it is to be a publicist for other people's books at the same time as you're writing your own book. And we thought she and Sarah would be a nice match, and they are an amazing match. Um, so we did that with 13 more authors, and um, we'll hear a little bit more about that as we go on. But um, I'll conclude before welcoming Romy and Sloan to join me just with a very quick observation about what motivated us um, in, a, in a broader sense with the idea of doing a book like this. And it really was counter the notion 
that history is made up exclusively and not even primarily by the person at the top. And I think for many, many people, the history of Alfred Barr and the history of the Museum of Modern Art are synonymous. And every brilliant thing that happened at the Museum of Modern Art was one way or another attributed to Alfred Barr. And without taking one thing away from him, I think the great thing about history in the 2020s or in the 21st century is that we realize that the great man story is a very incomplete story and that every great man, whether it's Picasso or Alfred Barr, is in fact a much more complex and much wider community of people um, than any one figure really ever truthfully um, represents. And so what we wanted to do here was get away from the great man theory of history and to the multitude of act, you know, um, actual contributors, makers of history, um, from the most important famous to the anonymous and unrecognized, and try to rewrite history from that point of view. So that's what our 14 women helped us do. Um, our parameters were that they were here either in the 30s or the first half of the 40s. Um, because otherwise, as you know, we could have gone on a very, very long um, time with the women who arrived in the 50s, 60s, etc. But um, that's our scope. And with that, I'm going to invite Romy and Sloan to these comfy chairs up here. <laughs> And um, I guess we get lights on.